I'm going to ask Jordan if he would come at this time. We're going to light our candles. We light three candles this morning, the first week of Advent. We, it was the candle of prophecy. And all the Old Testament foretold, it seems, that the Messiah would come. The second week we lit the, the candle of Bethlehem and reminding us of the location that our Lord was born. This morning we light the third candle. Uh, it's called the candle of the shepherds. And we'll be talking about that today. And then Kim is going to come and read and Carol's going to come and read. So listen to the word of the Lord this morning. This will be from Isaiah 35, 3 through 10. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen. <coughs> okay, I'm going to be reading Matthew 11, 2 through 6. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Amen. And now you all get to stand up and sing. Get to turn to page 184 in our hymnals and sing, God rest you, merry gentlemen. I think we'll do the first, second, and fifth verses on this one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bev and Bonnie and Mary. I appreciate all of that. I've got three daily devotionals up here left. I want to put them in somebody's hand today. So if you didn't get one of these daily devotionals of our daily bread, I mean, it's already end of December. Somebody needs to take these home and use them. They're uh, uh, good stuff. And I read them every day. I need to do that. Join me in the Gospel of Luke, if you would, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2. Good to see everybody here today. Luke 2, verse 8. There was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. That's to put it mildly. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe lying in, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord's, Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste. And they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Father, would you add your blessings yes. to this word and this time and bless our ears to hear and the mouth to speak and hearts to understand. Father, do your work today in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's hard for me to believe, and I've been going through this with you, but it's still hard for me to believe we're in week, week three of Advent. I, I'm tempted to say, how did we get here? But here we are. Week one, we, we talked about the long wait. And Mary, it wasn't just she waited nine months. Mary waited, after nine months, she waited 30 years. 30 years to see the, the, the miracles begin to happen in the life of Jesus as he began his ministry. That's a long wait. And the message was, if you've been waiting on God or, or the promises of God to unfold in your life, Mary would say to all of us, it's worth the wait. Hang on there. Hang on. Get, don't give up. Don't throw in a towel. Continue to wait. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord in your life and whatever he has promised you, he will do it in his time. Week two, we talked about the tough decisions, and that was all about Joseph. And even though the angel came to him and gave him a word, Joseph still had to step out in faith and make a tough decision. And when neighbors and everybody made fun of him and mocked him for what he was doing, he did it anyway. We believe he died long before Jesus was on the cross. Uh, he's not in the picture in the scriptures, but he went in faith and he did it anyway. Sometimes following God is not easy, but it's always the right thing to do. Amen. Here we are week three with the shepherds, and I titled this, I borrowed the title from George Beverly Shea in that song, The Wonder of It All, and I just said, that works for this. It, isn't it wonderful, the Christmas message? Where would we be Christmas story without the shepherds? Think about that. You can't take any of the, those players out of the story and it's the same. The shepherds are, are there in the pageant and the live nativities. And in the story, it's all part of it. God chose shepherds to bring the most glorious story that the Son of God was born onto this earth, not to the rich and famous, not to the celebrities, not to the movers and shakers of the world, but to lowly shepherds, the blue-collar workers of life, the Lord chose to break the best news, the good news, the gospel that God sent His Son into the world. Shepherds of all people. 
Now the committees, if it was left up to the committee, that'd be the last people on the list. No, no, no. Yeah, we're not going there. We don't want the likes of them running the party. We don't want even want them in the room. But God did. And he chose people like shepherds. Can I remind you what history tells us about the shepherds back in those days? Number one, they were literally despised. They were not people you invited over for lunch. They were kept at a distance. They lived with sheep 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They lived with sheep. They didn't get weekends off. They didn't punch a time clock and they got to leave. No, their profession was they were shepherds and they lived with the sheep and very rarely did they ever bathe. They stank. And you didn't want them around. You, you, you just even get close to them. They smell just like the sheep. Number two, they never went to church services at the temple. They never attended any of them. And uh, they were ceremonially unclean because of all the ritual washings. They never kept that. So they couldn't come to the temple because they had, on the job, they had ten sheep. So they couldn't come to any sacrifices, any ceremony, any of that. They were unclean. Beyond that, they had a bad reputation. They were considered to be thieves and robbers and outlaws. They had a very hard time, they say, discerning what was yours and what was theirs. They, they, if anything ever turned up missing, it was always blamed on shepherds. They were forever moving their sheep from pasture to pasture to feed them and to keep them it was something to eat, and whenever the news was that the shepherds were moving their sheep, you better keep an eye on your flock because they had a history of when they would pass by, some of your flock would disappear and it would go with them. Not only were they considered thieves and robbers, but, but their reputation was uh, so poor, you, their, their testimony wasn't even admissible in the court of law. They would not allow a shepherd, even if he was an eyewitness to something, they were not allowed to testify because everybody knows they lie. You can't trust them. You weren't even, according to the Talmud, you weren't even supposed to help a shepherd if he was in need. Keep your distance. Life for them was hard and drab and endless work and a never-ending job and no thanks and no appreciation. They didn't even own the sheep. It's not their sheep. Their, their, their job is just simply to care for a flock for somebody else and you, nobody ever got rich taking care of sheep. And never did they ever get thanked. It, it was just a thankless job, long hours. You're out in all elements of the weather and the cold in the winter and, and the rain and the snow and, and the hot sun in the summertime and, and it was just a miserable job. Can I remind you what it says in Genesis when Joseph was telling his brothers when they were coming to Egypt and he said, tell, tell everybody you took care of cattle. <laughs> Don't tell them you took care of sheep because sheep, shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. Well, not a whole lot changed down through the centuries. There was still this animosity against shepherds. In the eyes of the people, they didn't want them around. But aren't you glad in the eyes of God, he said, that's the ones I want to send my message to. The kind of people that God will pick out of this world. Can I remind you what Paul said in his first letter to the church at Corinth? He said, God has not chosen, or God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of this world, catch this, and the things which are despised have God chosen. He put a premium on the shepherds. When nobody else wanted him around, God said, I do. The heart of God has always been for the castaways, the throwaways that our society looks at. They exalt the, what Robin calls the beautiful people. You know, they celebrate those folks. And everybody else is just discarded. God doesn't discard anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your reputation is. It doesn't matter what life has brought you. God loves everybody. cares for everybody. Amen. And that's the same way with the shepherds. He gives his best and his most to people like that. Jesus talked about 
<clears throat> the poor in spirit, the poor in heart. Those who know they've got nothing to offer, but they're just clinging to God. Well, it was an ordinary, boring, drab, maybe cold night. Verse 8 says it was nighttime. And there's something going to happen to these shepherds that is going to change their life forever and ever, that they will forever talk about. And here we are, we're still talking about it today. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, on a very ordinary, boring night, God dispatches angels, and one angel appears. And we don't know if it was standing on the ground. We don't know if it was hovering in the air or if it was up in the sky. But in a moment, the Bible says here in Luke 2, that an angel, verse 9, came upon him, and the glory of the Lord. That's the Shekinah of God. His glory, His presence that was on Mount Sinai, that was at the tabernacle and later the temple that filled the house that Isaiah saw and Moses saw and others were allowed to behold. The glory of God shone around about Him. The only way I can describe that is if you watch the news where some helicopter and some search and rescue mission shines a bright light down on somebody Maybe they want to be found, maybe they don't. But this great light shines down around about them, and that's the only way I can describe it. It is the, the brilliance of the glory of God down on them, and it is no wonder it says they were sore afraid. Out of darkness they are picked out, and God's glory, and an angel begins to talk to them. Fear not. And it is no wonder. That's the first thing he says. Fear, don't be afraid. It's okay. Behold, I bring you good tidings, good news, of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And here's your sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. And then it's as though all of heaven opened up and exploded with the glory of God. And there are more angels than you can count. And they're singing and giving praise to God. And these shepherds, and he never seen nothing like that in their life, and never will again. This is a moment to just jaw-dropping glory of the God and angels and spellbounding wonder. What a night. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Greatest night that they've ever had in ever of their life. I can't, I can't paint it bright enough. What a moment. What a night. I want to stop right there for a moment. I want to now move into conjecture. I want you to imagine with me for a moment. What if? What if the shepherds never went to Bethlehem? What if after this great brilliance of God and this message and, and the angels, what if they then went the rest of their life and everybody they met, everybody they saw, they told about an experience with angels? Man, you should have been there. It was wonderful. And they talk about the size of the angels and the color of their clothes and wings and the music and the bright lights and they and they go in great detail and describe them and 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 right down to the detail where nothing is left out and they spend the rest of their life telling everybody about this great glorious event of seeing angels but they don't go to bethlehem we would we would stop short and say but but what was the whole point of the angels message the whole point of all of it was to take them to Bethlehem to take them to Jesus wasn't it all of this gl glory and greatness and beauty and music and, and spectacular goodness of God was to take them to Jesus I've been thinking about that all week Yet isn't that the very thing that's happening every day on a bigger scale in our world? People are taking in the goodness of God and the greatness of God and His glory every day. But they don't go to Jesus. 
We take in every day His goodness. And yet so many just take it for granted. And we talk about the good times and we get together and share and all. Oh, let me tell you what happened. And... But they never connect the dots and say, it's God that made that happen in your life. Think for a moment of the most beautiful, scenic place you've ever been in all your life. The most beautiful, wonderful, scenic location of all your travels, the most beautiful place you've ever been. Somebody, quickly, name a spot. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. Somebody else. Hawaii. Hawaii. Oh. <laughs> What's the most beautiful, spectacular place? Hiawassee, Georgia. Hiawassee. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty here. The Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Glacier National Park. Glacier. Oh, yeah. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe. We've been to some beautiful places, haven't we? I was thinking about this today. I remember hiking up in the Smokies during the fall and, and going up to Mount Leconte on that trail. And every once in a while, the tree, the tree line opens up and, and you can see out where you're at. And as far as you can see, and, and, and the leaves were at peak. And it was just one magnificent view after another. And it was just awesome, glorious. I'm like some of you, I've been at Grand Canyon, and you stand there on uh, close to the, close to the end, <laughs> close, and you look out, and it doesn't matter how far you look, it's just incredible, and you look down if you dare, and it's beautiful. How can you see all that and you don't look up? And say, what a mighty God we serve. All of that beauty should do something. It should take us to Jesus. We sing that. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies. God lets you see that, and, and just for that moment of that time, you, it should do something in your heart. It should take you to the point where you say, Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. Romans 1 says that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and glory, meaning that all of creation is preaching a sermon saying, look at God. But so many people are worshiping the creation and never say, but who made all this? I say that all of that points you back to a, a divine creator who made it all and should cause us, take us to Jesus. Think about the most ex wonderful experiences in your life. Those high water marks, life changing moments, the thrill of a lifetime. Walking across the platform to get a degree that you worked on for a long time and years for some and sacrifices and long hours and a oh, boatload of money. And, <laughs> and you walk across and they hand you that and and you know it's yours, you, you did it, you accomplished something, and it's just, it's a moment you'll never forget. Think about fellas standing down there at the altar, and your love of your life is coming down the aisle, and uh, she could have had all the men in the world, or any of them, and, and yet she chose you. And you're standing there at that moment, and you say, oh. Somebody always gets the better of a deal. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know you, it's you. <laughs> a moment you'll never forget. She's just radiant. And there you stand. And she said, I want to live with that guy the rest of my life. Think about inking that deal on that dream home. You really wanted it, and now it happened. The financing, all of that, and... The other people were knocked out, and you got it. And if you keep making the payments, you can stay there. <laughs> but the dream come true of that home, getting to live where you live. I remember a moment in the delivery room with Robin and with both of our daughters. And, you know, back in the day, you, you, there's the labor room, and then there's a the delivery room. And, and I'm, they've got a little stool there, and I'm there by her, her bed. And... and uh, She's there and the doctor and team and I'm holding her hand and I'm praying 
God help me. God help me. <laughs> God help me. Give, you know, give, God help me. I need, I need, I need, I need help. God. <laughs> now I'm praying for her too. <laughs> and then that moment, delivery. And the nurse has handed the baby and she cleans our daughter up, wraps it up. And she handed it to me first. Our firstborn daughter. Go through that with our second daughter. And I'm sitting there holding a daughter for the first time. And all oh, the majesty of that moment, the glory of only God. You think about the miracle of birth and how this all happens. And then I hold hand a daughter to our Robin, my wife. And how do you not bow your head and say, thank you, Jesus? How do you go through something like that and it not just melt your heart that you want to run to Jesus and say, oh, God. Think about the most delicious food you've ever tasted. Think about that. The most tasty, best dish You've ever tasted. Somebody quickly, where, what was it? What is your favorite dish? Lemon pie. Lemon pie. Oh. A juicy steak. Juicy steak. What? Ribeye. But, but, but cooked how? Medium well. Medium well. Somebody else, what, what is the, the best dish you've ever had? My dad's roast beef. Dad's roast beef. Somebody else. Cheesecake. What would life be without cheesecake? <laughs> Somebody else. Big pie with ice cream. <laughs> I heard another one. I said coffee. Coffee. <laughs> Amen. I, I remember a lady by the name of Margaret Starks. David does too. She made the best German potato salad. We'd have church dinners, and I'd always walk through right before church started just to see if Margaret brought her potato salad. And I just told everybody, I got dibs on that. She made a carrot cake from scratch. I mean, I'm not even talking about it now. When I preached her funeral, I told everybody about it then as well. I mean, this, this is just incredible. I mean, she, she made it from scratch. She cleaned carrots and cooked carrots, and, and she made a carrot cake that was just to die for. And the icing was, to, not only was it the cake, but the icing was homemade. I mean, and it was the icing on the cake. It was, it was just fabulous. Oh. I think about my mama's chicken dumpling. She made some stuff that was good. She made some stuff that wasn't good. <laughs> but but she, her chicken dumplings was my favorite. I mean, they just... If she said she made them, I always stayed for lunch. My mama's homemade, or my grandma's homemade bread. Nobody in the family has ever been able to equal it or make it like she did. She took it to the grave. I remember when I was in sixth grade, and I'm in the kitchen with her, and, and I'm not asking grandma how to make it, and she just real quickly goes through it. She didn't use any measuring cups or any, she didn't measure nothing. It was by her hands. And she just, this and this, and I'm, I, she's moving too fast, and I can keep up with it, and I wish I knew how to make it. Everybody wishes they knew how to make it. Grandma's homemade bread that she made in a skillet was just awesome. Robin's mom's sausages that she would fix in a big skillet with peppers and onions and a tomato sauce that was just... And spices. I mean, Robin's a good cook, but she can't even make what her mama used to make it. Oh man, I could just, I wish I was a cow with two stomachs whenever whenever she was fixing that because I would have filled both of them. Are you hungry yet? <laughs> I am of the opinion that even a good meal should take you to Jesus. You should bow your head. Not just and say, God bless this food, but when it's over, I think a good meal with good friends made by the best loved person in your life. 
should make you bow your head and say, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. <laughs> Deuteronomy, we've been studying Deuteronomy on Wednesday night, and Moses said to the people of Israel, he said, when you have eaten and are full, don't you forget God. When you have eaten and are full, even that should take you back to Jesus. And you should, that should drive you. Think of people that will miss heaven. How pitiful, how sad, how tragic. I think that in eternity, even a meal will remind them that there's a God in heaven. Did you know that chickens, for years they said chickens have no taste? Did you know that? They've come around now and said, well, chickens can taste. I've wondered because if you knew what they ate, you'd say that they, they can't have any taste buds. Humans have, on average, they say 10,000 taste buds. Chickens, at best, have like 300, 350. And they're so back in their throat that they eat stuff and it's down their craw before they even taste it. It would have to be for what they eat. <laughs> God didn't have to give mankind taste buds. Right. He didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But he did. Because he's a good God. That you can have the discretion between, I like white ch chocolate or dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. I like deep dish, or thin crust. That's the kind of God He is. And even in all of your decisions of what you like, what you don't like, there's a God in heaven that did all that just for you and me. The psalmist said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by a good God. Amen. Where am I going with this? <coughs> Romans chapter 2, we're a long way from the shepherds, but no, we're not. This, in Romans chapter 2, Paul wrote, It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Yes. It's the goodness of God that takes us yes. out of ourselves and unto Jesus. We, we, we watch people go through one tragedy after another and say, What's it going to take for them to ever wake up and realize they need Jesus? Tragedy and out of one briar patch into another one. Think, what, when, when are they going to ever wake up? My friends, the gospel says it shouldn't take tragedy. It says the goodness of God, the very fact that God is good to you, should take us to Jesus. James said, for every good and perfect gift is from where? From above, the Father of lights, which there is no variableness, no shadow of turning, meaning He doesn't play favorites and He doesn't change. Luke 2, verse 15, we're back to the shepherds, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. In verse 16, And they came with haste. You know, the end of the story, they didn't just go out and talk about angels. The rest of their life, they have the end of the story, as Paul Harvey said. And oh, by the way, the best thing of this, this would knelt of a feed trough. And there was a baby, and his name is Jesus. And they went out, and they told everybody everywhere they went, not just about angels, that's part of the story. It happened, and we're still talking about it. But the best news is our Savior, His name is Jesus. Amen. Has God been good to you? Yes. Have you thought about that lately? How good He's been to you? The psalmist said, Surely, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Psalmist also said, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He's good. Sing with me. God is so good. God is so God is so good, He's 
so good to me. I'm going to ask you to stand. Paul said it's the goodness of God that brings us to Jesus. It was the goodness of God that he sent a message to the shepherds. It was the goodness of God that broke forth in front of them and they realized it and they followed it out. And it's the goodness of God that's been all over your life as well. Question is, have you been to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. If you've not, if you've not come to the Savior, if you've not come to Jesus today, right now, where you're at, I want you to pray a prayer with me. Because it would be tragic if you took in all of God's goodness and you never came to Jesus. He loves you. He sent His Son for you. That's the whole Christmas story. It's not the trees, not the lights. He loves you. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for my sins. I repent of all my wrong and sin. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I give you my life. I want to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for Jesus. My life is yours. <clears throat> Thank you for your goodness to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now if you prayed that for the first time, I want you to tell me that today. I don't want you to slip it out. I want you to tell me. And, and, and we're going to have a long talk about that. <laughs> Maybe not right in here, but we're going to, I'll get together with you today and we're going to have a long talk. And we're going to carry this on. Praise God. I want to congratulate you if you did. <clears throat> We're going to have a dinner here in just a minute, and we're going to have our prayer for the food right here while everybody's together in one place before we all scatter, but we're going to pray for the food and ask His blessings, and uh, I do hope that you'll stay. We've got more than enough food for everybody, and uh, it just wouldn't be the same without you. So please, if you can, push other things aside and stay with us, and fellowship across the table with one another, and... Uh, uh, we probably won't get to do this again before Christmas, so let's make the most of it. Father, we thank you for the food that's been prepared and carried in. For the gals that have helped and uh, for everybody that had a part in making this meal special. Father, bless them. Bless them, bless them. Bless all who gather around the table, Lord, I pray. And may your joy and your laughter and love just... Well up in our heart that we have a good time today. May it be rich and may it be special and may it be, oh, one of the best. All because you've been good to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. I, if I don't get to shake your hand here, I'll shake it over in the fellowship hall. But God bless you. And uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Thank you for coming today.